Good morning. Welcome to the Oregon edition of our webinar series exploring state findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat 2040, Choosing an Abundant Future. Before we get started, let me run through some quick logistics. And while I'm doing that, you can look at the agenda for our hour together. Everyone has been muted, so don't worry about your own background noise. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. At the top, you see an orange arrow. If you click on that, that minimizes the control panel. And if you click on it again, it brings it back out. In that control panel, you will see a questions tab. And to insert a question, click on that little box on the right-hand side that expands that part of the control panel. And you can put your questions or comments right in there. We will have a period at the end of the webinar to take questions. Um, on that control panel, you'll also see a handouts section. You'll see that there are two. If you click on that part of the control panel, it will take you to the full Farms Under Threat 2040 report and to the Oregon State Summary that we're going to talk through briefly. Um, if, as we get into the web um, site section of our webinar today, you can't see the maps, try minimizing the control panel using that orange um, uh, arrow at the top. So let me introduce myself and my co-host. I am Chris Coffin. I direct AFT's National Agricultural Land Network, which is an information and peer learning network for professionals and community advocates working to save farm and ranch land. I am also AFT's Senior Policy Advisor, specializing in farmland protection, land access, and farm viability. And co-hosting with me today is Danny Madrone. Danny is AFT's Pacific Northwest Policy, Policy Manager, based in Olympia, Washington. So let's take a minute for those of you who may not be familiar with American Farmland Trust, we are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We are also the only National Agricultural Land Trust. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. Um, in fact, uh, we have a bumper sticker before that that said it's not farmland without farmers. We understand agriculture and we take a holistic approach to it. Our national initiatives and regional programs focus not just on protecting the land base, but also on the practices used on the land and on the farmers and ranchers who work the land, both there, those now and into the future. Our programs and our research together inform our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, D.C. And with that, let me now turn it over to Danny. Thanks, Chris. And thank all of you for joining us. We'd like to recognize and thank USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service for their partnership and financial support for our Farms Under Threat research. Farms Under Threat is AFT's multi-year initiative to document the status of and threats to America's agricultural land base. NRCS has been an integral partner on this research, as has our research partner, Conservation Science Partners. For this report, we had a second research partner in the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge that we have some important guests who registered uh, from Senator Michael Dembro's office, Senator Deb Patterson's office, Representative Vicki Brees Iverson's office, Representative Courtney Neron's office, Representative Anna Sharp's office, Oregon NRCS, Oregon's Departments of Agriculture, Land Conservation and Development, Fish and Wildlife and Watershed Enhancement Board, Oregon State University, and numerous counties, cities, soil and water conservation districts, land trusts, and other NGOs across the state. The list is too extensive to call you all out by name, but we appreciate each and every one of you. And now I would like to welcome a very special guest, Deputy Director of the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Lauren Henderson. Lauren has a long history with ODA. 
Prior to his appointment as a deputy director, he served as the assistant director for 15 years. Lauren has served under four directors as the agency's chief financial officer. He has managed and provided leadership over agency programs, including food safety, animal health, plant protection and conservation, natural resource, and market access and certification. Lauren is a lifelong Oregonian and was born and raised in Madras, a rural community in central Oregon. Thank you so much for joining us, Lauren. And with you today is also ODA's Land Use and Water Planning Coordinator, Jim Johnson. Jim has been with ODA for over 25 years. In this role, he is involved in a broad range of land use matters, both in policy and implementation venues, all from the perspective of agriculture. His professional career has bridged local, state, and regional perspectives, including work in the Department of Land Conservation and Development, Oregon's Land Use Planning Agency. While at the LCED, Jim was the lead planner for farms and forest planning. Lauren, um, you've had a chance to review the summary findings from the report. We would love to hear from you. What struck you most about these findings? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the, the good introduction. And, and it looks like we have about 60 people in attendance here. So I think that tells you the interest that this topic has. But I can tell you a couple things that stuck out at me in the in the report as I read it. And I will just say this. It's not one of those reports that you can read once. Um, it, you got to really read it a couple of times um, and maybe even a third time because there's a lot of information. And so I will just I will just say that it's well worth the read. Um, and I, I would encourage folks to really delve into the information. But one one thing I will say um, is being a lifelong Oregonian, it, looking at the tables and I'll just admit uh, I, I skipped through the report and went right to the tables because that's I'm kind of a data guy. So Oregon, fr frankly, is doing fairly well in relationship to some of the other states in the nation. That being said, and that's mostly due to Oregon's land use system. We had some leaders in our state in the 70s that uh, cared about this uh, subject immensely and put in Oregon's land use system along with the, an agency that dedicated to do that. And so I, I would say that system has, I think, prevented um, what could be a lot worse situation in Oregon. But also that being said, we are losing farmland in Oregon. And Jim, my colleague can probably tell you what that looks like over the years. Um, Oregon um, has a tremendous amount of family farms. It's 97% or more of that. But along with that is 12 or 1300 century farms. And those are farms that are um, have been in a family for over 100 years, and we have about 50 that have been in 150 years. And my concern after reading the report is we're not going to have those farms anymore if if our leaders um, and our citizens in our state probably take a, a similar concentrated effort like they did in the 70s to say, what more can we do uh, to, sh to ensure that we are able to keep um, our working lands? The other thing that I noticed is maybe something that really wasn't said in the report, and um, I don't think it needs to be said, and if it, if it is, I missed it, is this. It is very clear to me, and this is something that I look at in reports like this, is once that farmland is converted, there is no, there is no data point in this report that shows parking lots being turned back into farmland. Uh, once it's lost, it's, it's lost. Um, and that is a concern. I think it's something we all need to pay attention to. And then the last point I'll make is this. I think the report does a really good job of capturing not only the land conversion issues, but there is a lot of pressure points on our farmers and ranchers in our state beyond, um, beyond just the land use principles. But with COVID, that brought up the need for thinking about this subject. Our drought is bringing up this subject all those kinds of things um, in protecting what we have because uh, I, I really don't think as an, a citizen day to day they really connect how important it is to keep um, our working lands as working lands so i will just leave that congratulate you on the comprehensive report um, and looking forward to what folks have to say uh, in the presentation here so thank you for the invite and thank you lauren Jim, I've got a question for you. How do you think this research can be used by the folks on this webinar to help save farmland and ranch land? 
uh, great. Yeah. Thank, uh, thanks. First, uh, hello, everyone. And uh, you guys, I just, you can see why I like working for Lauren, uh, everyone. Uh, he, what he said is, is just so right on. So um, in, in regards to how the, the research can be used, um, the first thing that really comes to mind for me is when you look um, not just at, the, at the, um, the data, but if you look at the maps, and as much as Lauren is a data guy, I'm a maps guy. Um, and when you look at the maps and you look at the scenarios and the like, I think what this study can do a, a lot to do is to help us in Oregon to show how effective our planning program is and to help defend it. I, the, the planning program is constantly under attack. Uh, every legislative session, there's there's attempts to to weaken it to, uh, and the like. And I think what the report does is gives us a, a real strong um, indicator of how well our program does, especially when you look at the different scenarios, runaway sprawl, um, it's not, but when you look at better built cities and the like, and you compare them, but then you just go and look at other states and compare it to, to Oregon, you can really see that. So that's the first thing that really comes to my mind is help us to defend the, the program. It also helps us to target um, problem areas and problem issues. And uh, so there, there are certain areas on the map that when you when you uh, look through those maps and you look through the scenarios that stand out and they they um, when you analyze those more closely um, you there are issues associated with those so they help us to not only target issue areas or uh, issue areas but problem areas and that brings me to the third point and that is to help us to use the other strategic tools such as conservation easements that it'll help us to target where we think that those uh, strategic uh, uh, complementary tools to the planning program can can be utilized to the best efforts. All right, and I've got one more question here for you. What steps would you like to see state or local governments or even the federal government take to reduce the conversion of farmland? Uh, I could talk all day on this, but um, <laughs> Um, you know, for, I'll start with the federal program first, um, and this has been a pet peeve of mine for most of my career. Um, one of the things the federal program, feds, feds could do is to put some real, uh, some real teeth into the Farmland Protection Act. Um, I don't know how many times over the years in my career I've been asked to review projects that have federal funding associated with them uh, and uh, where the federal program is supposed to help to protect especially prime farmland, but you know, quality farmland. And really all it is is, uh, hey, we've got quality farmland here, but then nothing's ever really done from the federal end of it in terms of, of uh, you know, putting teeth into that federal protection policy program. So that would be the, the one thing that I think that the feds could do beyond also uh, even giving us more money in, in the uh, ASEP uh, ale program. So uh, the, that's from the feds program. Um, from at the state level, um, I think that the, the state of Oregon can can do a better job to analyze um, the cumulative impact of non-farm development um, on agricultural lands, especially those zoned exclusive farm use. Um, not only to analyze that, but then once we've seen really the cumulative impact out there, and I can tell you it's it's there. But this 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 type of work will help us to actually show show, show something on the ground where it is. After we analyze that cumulative impact, then address the cumulative impact. Uh, over 50 non-farm uses are allowed in Oregon's exclusive farm use zone, and most of those are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, and not and there's no real determination of the cumulative impact of all of that uh, development on farmland. Um, also, I think it would help us to look at um, uh, urban growth allocation. There's a real issue in this state, um, is, as well as we do with urban growth boundaries and our urban policy, our policy still guarantees that every city grows. And that's ultimately um, a recipe for coalescing urban growth boundaries and not protecting our best farmland. And maybe it's time that Oregon uh, needs to look at regional growth uh, uh, considerations similar to what the Portland Metro region does, but do that on a statewide basis or, or sub-regional around the state in different regions. And lastly, for the locals, um, and you know, coming from that background initially in my career, I think what the, the, the locals can really do is, to, is to, to network more with us at the, the, at the state level and, and the like um, um, and help us to, to, to get the resources that you need to not only to implement the program, but to better educate the public on what the program has done and can do and, and how important it is to the state's uh, second largest economic sector. Thank you so much, uh, Lauren and Jim, both of you for being here with us today and for sharing some of your wisdom. Chris, I will pass it on back to you. 
Great, thanks so much, Danny. So now we are going to dive into the methodology and the findings from the report. And let me just stop for a minute and thank Jim and thank the Deputy Secretary. I hope you are both able to stay on for the rest of the webinar. If you're not, we completely understand, but if so, we look forward to coming back to you potentially um, as we go through the webinar. So now with that, um, let's dive into the findings. The first two Farms Under Threat reports, Farms Under Threat State of America's Farmland, which we released in 2018, and Farms Under Threat State of the States released in 2020, mapped past conversion of agricultural land. First, uh, looking first from 1992 to 2012, and then from 2001 to 2016. In this report, we're looking forward, using past conversion data to model and predict future conversion of farm and ranch land out to 2040. We started with the state of the state's analysis of conversion from 2001 to 2016. As a reminder, that analysis mapped conversion of land to two different types, urban and high density development and low density residential development. So let's take a look at what we mean when we talk about those two kinds of things. Urban and highly developed uh, land is the traditional culprit in farmland conversion. It's been mapped and it's been tracked for many years. It includes residential, industrial, and commercial areas typically found in and around cities and towns. It also includes rural industrial sites such as oil and gas infrastructure and solar development. Anything that can be identified by satellite remote sensing is built up. Low density residential development has, been, has become a more pervasive culprit and AFT worked with conservation science partners to pioneer an approach to map and quantify the impacts of this type of development on the agricultural land base. So these areas typically range from lower density subdivisions to farmettes and ranchettes. Typically, this kind of scattered large lot housing fragments the agricultural land base and makes production harder for the farmer, farms and ranches that remain. It's important to note that some agriculture can be found in low density residential development. And these smaller farm parcels, especially those near urban centers, can be very profitable. However, our research has found that once land has been converted to low density residential development, it is far more likely to be further converted to urban and highly developed land. Starting with our historical data, we projected into the future with the business as usual scenario. Basically, we made a straight line projection using the same annual conversion rate as what we documented from 2001 to 2016 to predict the level and location of conversion by 2040. We adjusted the model to account for projected population growth. Building off that scenario, we developed two alternative scenarios, which we'll get to in a minute. For each of the three scenarios, we also mapped the coastal flooding risk that is projected by sea level rise. Once we had the projection of conversion and the flooding risk, we quantified the effects of these scenarios on the agricultural land types. So was conversion more likely to be on cropland or rangeland or pasture, as well as on the agricultural quality of the land. As with any modeling exercise, there are some caveats. Most importantly, we, we were not able to account for local zoning. Land use regulations are inherently local and there is no national database of them. This means that our maps represent the general pattern and the rough amount of conversion that is likely based on those 2001 to 2016 conversion patterns. They do not reflect what may be allowed or prohibited on the ground through local land use regulations. Our modeling also does not include the impact of water scarcity and potential fallowing of land because of water scarcity or salinization. Mapping this impact involves a complex interplay of many variables and was simply beyond the scope of our analysis. 
You'll see when we get to the website, though, that we did include a data overlay from World Resource Institute's Aqueduct, which offers some projections about water availability in the future. So here are the three scenarios we modeled. Again, first, business as usual, um, using that 2001 to 26 data and making a straight line projection out to 2040. The second scenario is what we call runaway sprawl. This envisions a scenario where sprawl actually gets worse. And we know this is possible, driven by high housing costs in urban areas and the opportunity for more remote work, which is likely to be improved as rural broadband continues to expand. In fact, we suspect that some parts of the country are already on this trajectory. Lastly, we model the future we hoped for, better built cities. This scenario envisions successful efforts to reduce the footprint of residential, commercial, and industrial development on productive agricultural land. While the scenario still results in the conversion of some land, it envisions a future with vibrant, compact cities and towns and abundant farm and ranch land to meet the needs of the future. And here's a quick look at the assumptions that went into that three scenarios. So again, you see for business as usual, that was a straight um, line projection for both urban and high density and low density residential conversion. We did adjust for future population growth in the urban and highly developed um, land conversion because there's a strong correlation between development, population growth and urban um, development. Um, for the runaway sprawl, you see that we left that same rate of urban and highly developed land conversion. We increased by 50% the rate of low density residential growth. Um, and that was our assumption given on what we've seen in the projections that uh, one of the bigger culprits now is this type of low density um, sprawling development. Conversely, in the better built cities, you see that what we did was that we projected a reduction in that rate of conversion, 25%, um, which we felt based on um, the research is out there that cities and towns can grow um, more compact, that sort of rate. And uh, you see that we had a more aggressive attempt at trying to reduce that low density residential conversion, saying that we could make a 50% reduction. So, this next chart shows each scenario's potential impact. And on the left there is just a recognition that that was the 11 million acres that have been converted just in this century alone. Um, under business as usual or worse runaway sprawl, you see here that we could see another 18.4 or even more than 24 million acres of farm and ranch land converted or threatened by conversion. Conversely, if we make smart choices about where and how we site future development, we can reduce the conversion of farm and ranch land to 11 million acres. So I know some of you think 11 million acres, that's still a lot. Is that really the best case scenario? AFT thought it was a realistic scenario. We appreciate that development, including renewable energy development, is necessary, and the need for affordable housing options is acute. While it may be possible for cities and towns to be even more compact in their growth, and we hope they can be, we chose what we believed was a realistic scenario. These next two slides we hope are helpful in showing how Oregon compares to other states. This slide shows projected total acres converted by county. The darker the red or the rust, the more acres will be converted. And so you see particularly the, the areas with the darkest rust here are in the Southwest. Um, if you look at the next slide, which is the percent of agricultural land in each county that's going to be projected um, for development, you see a different pattern. Again, this reflects the fact that in the eastern part of the United States, there's a lot of conversion in smaller counties um, with lower total amounts of agricultural land. So Another key finding relates to impacts on our very best agricultural land. 
For previous reports, AFT created the first ever index of agricultural land quality that looked at the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of land. For that, we created a PVR value. Land over a certain PVR threshold, we dubbed nationally significant land, land which we feel is best suited for long-term cultivation and food production. While this land is concentrated in certain parts of the country, every state, and you can see in Oregon, has some nationally significant land. What we find in our future projections is the conversion of this land is likely to be higher than conversion of all agricultural land, likely because for the same reason it is high quality agricultural land, because it's flat, well-drained, relatively free of rocks, it is very easily developed. The loss of this land is especially concerning. This is land that can produce the highest yields of crops and livestock with the least environmental impacts. Our modeling shows that nearly half of the projected conversion to 2040 will occur on nationally significant land, even though it represents less than 40% of all of the country's farm and ranch land. The more nationally significant land converted, the more reliant we become on marginal land for food production. And to put this potential loss of 9 million acres of nationally significant land in perspective, the total acreage of land in the U.S. devoted to fruit, nut, and vegetable production is just 10.4 million acres. So there are two last findings we would like to bring to your attention. The first relates to coastal flooding due to sea level rise. We mapped what this might look like in 2040 based on 7.5 inches of additional sea level rise. We found that 450,000 acres of farmland and ranch land could be flooded by 2040, including 4,400 acres in Oregon. This number does not include salinization of soils and groundwater, which will jeopardize many more acres even before land is inundated. Additionally, we found that nearly 500,000 acres of existing developed land, both urban and highly developed and low density residential land, will be flooded nationally, causing some residents to seek more stable housing inland. The result, another 2.7 million acres of agricultural land nationally that could be converted to development. And now let me turn it back over to Danny to talk through this next finding. Thank you, Chris. One of the other threats we are highlighting with this report is the threat that solar development poses to agricultural land. To be clear, American Farmland Trust is pro-renewable energy development. However, we think it's essential that we plan carefully so that our most productive, versatile, and resilient land is not compromised. We also think it's possible for agriculture and solar to coexist in mutually beneficial ways. In 2021, the legislature passed the Clean Energy Targets Bill requiring certain electricity providers to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The, the legislation sets a target for these providers to reduce emissions 100% below the baseline by 2040. Correspondingly, we have seen more and more interest in solar project proposals in the last few years. This image depicts data from the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Futures Studies, which anticipates that over 50,000 acres of currently undeveloped land in Oregon will be converted to utility-scale solar by 2040. The Department of Energy also predicts that about 90% of that utility-scale PV will be sited in rural communities. Not all of those acres will be agricultural land per se, but we can ex expect that a significant percentage will be. So clearly, this is an important conversation for us to be having in Oregon. Back to you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Danny. So now we're going to dive into the data available for Oregon on the website, and we will be ably assisted in our cruise into the website by our colleague and website navigator, Beth Fraser. So thank you, Beth. Um, when you start, and we have included the, uh, a link to this website in the, in the questions document, um, in the control panel, sorry. When you start, you come to this cover um, uh, 
graphic that talks about what we did, what we found. Again, this is just sort of very top line information. To get out of that, you simply click the X in the upper right hand side. That will take you out of it. Um, if you want to get back to it, up in the upper right hand corner of the website, you will see an about tab that brings it right back to you. So let's look up at that right hand um, corner, upper right hand corner. You also see a how to tab. That will take you to a five minute video that explains how to use the various data layers in the scenarios. The view report tab up there takes you to our farmland information center. There you can find the full report and the executive summary as well as the other technical information um, reports and in fact the last state of the state report as well. We are making the geospatial data layers from this project available to the public as we have done with the last ones from State of the States. So if you would like to um, get any of this data, the, you can go to the request data tab um, that Beth just showed you. So now we are going to zoom into Oregon what you do is you go to the state, you click on it, and what you will see then is what comes up on the left-hand side is the state information, and on the right-hand side is whatever county your cursor happened to be on when you clicked into Oregon, in this case, Crook County. So let's look at what is available on this screen right now because it's worth scrolling down so here you see in terms of the projections under each of these um, scenarios the darker rust is the urban and highly developed land projections the lighter orange is the low density residential development and you can see again that we have, and this is this is new information that we have these by county. So it's very helpful at the county level to show these projections um, and to learn more of what these particular projections look by county. Going down a little bit more, you can see that it. We look at both again as we were talking about um, the acres of land can projected for conversion based on the quality of the land. So you see here that um, we have taken the upper half of the land, the land that we consider to be the best quality land in Oregon and in the county and show the projections of that as well. So a subset of the, of the projections of conversion of ag land as a whole. And then further down here, you see that we have parceled out how the projections occur by um, agricultural land type. So here you see more of it on cropland, more conversion likely on cropland, then pasture land, some rangeland. And here, just to note on this woodland, in the state of the state's report, we came up with a methodology that um, was able to account for woodland associated with a farm or a ranch. This is obviously not all woodland or forest land in Oregon. It is simply the conversion, what we are estimating is conversion of woodland that is part of a farm or a ranch. Um, if you look down here at the bottom, you notice something that we feel is very important, and that is that low density residential development paves the way for future development. It tends to be a more interim land use. Um, again, not to say that there's not agriculture occurring in some smaller parcels and that some of that agriculture is very viable, but the fact that in Oregon, our projections show that agricultural land that was in low density residential development in 2016 is 98 times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2040. So let's run back up to um, just do a quick view of the state summary. So here you see a, the download report. Let's click on that really quickly. Um, and I wanna just scroll through here quickly to show, again, this is a wonderful two-pager that we hope everybody can download, can take it with them whenever their meetings 
uh, meetings with state legislators or policymakers or county um, officials, you name it, we think it will be particularly useful. And I just want to point out back on the first page of this that we did two things. We estimated what we felt were the, what, what we believe will be the impacts of that 109,000 acre projected conversion. Using 2017 census of agriculture data, we converted that potential land loss to impact a number of farms or ranches. So 1,200 farms or ranches that might go out of production entirely because of this conversion, resulting in a $65 million loss in farm output and potential loss of 2,700 jobs associated with agriculture. And then here on the right-hand side, you see the counties that um, we estimate through the projections as being the ones that will have the most conversion. So Deschutes, Jackson, Lane. And with that, let me turn it over to Danny and Beth, who are going to do a cruise through um, some of these counties. Thank you so much. And we'll also um, invite Jim to chime in with uh, his observations as we cruise around the state. But let's go ahead and start in Deschutes County. Uh, one right below that. See where Ben is? Yep, there you go. Let's zoom in right there. And if we can zoom in on Ben and a little bit of Redmond up there as well, we'll get the bulk of the urban area. Thank you, Beth. Runaway sprawl is what we're going to see on the left here and better built cities on the right. So this is an area that is growing a lot population wise. And you can see there's quite a bit of a difference between the runaway sprawl and the better built cities. Jim, I'll invite you to chime in and, and tell us what you're seeing here on the ground. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, first thing I'd like to point out is when you look at runaway sprawl, it's pretty much the same in Oregon as business as usual. There's some differences in the like. So, you know, people wanted to see compare business as usual to, to better built cities. It's going to be very similar. So I just wanted to point that out. You know, what, what I really see here is, is a, a couple of things. Um, you know, of course, you, can, you see a lot of the development in close compact to the two cities. And so some of that's going to be um, planned growth in that it's probably with inside the, the city's urban growth boundaries. But having said that, whether they're inside an urban growth boundary or not, it goes to show that Oregon's urban growth policies may need to take a look at protecting of some of that land. Um, the other thing is, is when you look at the areas between Bend and Redmond, for example, and you could also actually say that some of this about Crook County and Prineville and, and uh, the Madras area in Jefferson County, you look at some of these areas that are outside um, that are lower density residential and the like, um, we've got some issues, especially in Deschutes County, but in all three of the counties here with uh, non-farm development outside of urban growth boundary areas. And the thing that concerns me the most in the situation of Deschutes County is that it's not just that that this is having an impact on the land base, this is having an impact on the water availability for commercial agriculture. A lot of this lower density residential development has senior water rights within some of the smaller irrigation districts to the true larger scale commercial farms that are, are interspersed throughout the area. And the, the more holes you punch in the ground, the less availability there is water for commercial agriculture. And so we really need to be considering the impacts of non-farm development, not only on land loss, but, but the impacts to water availability to agriculture in Central Oregon. All right. And now let's um, switch over to, um, let's go ahead and switch over to Malheur County, which is on the far right of the, uh, of the state. Yep, you've got it right there. And if you could just zoom into where Ontario is at, which is right on the border with Idaho. And what you'll see here is that we're actually not projecting a whole ton of um, 
of future development in this area. But it is worth noting um, that more is anticipated in Idaho that will create pressure for Oregon. And um, I'll also note that SB 16, which passed the late legislature in 2021, did create a pathway to rezoning some of the uh, agricultural land in Mount Hugh County to low density residential. Jim, what are your observations here? Well, I, my, my first one is just look at the, the uh, state line there, Ontario on the left and Idaho on the right. And Fruitland is kind of an unincorporated area in, in Idaho or the like. But uh, bottom line, what it shows is the effectiveness of the Oregon planning program to protect the same quality of farmland that's on the Idaho side that's being converted. Uh, this is this is one of the great great examples, and there's uh, several of them where you're on count on state lines in Oregon where you can see the the dramatic difference between uh, Oregon's land use planning program and protecting agricultural lands and other states' lack of protecting agricultural lands. Great. Now we're going to jump back east over to Jackson County. This is over where Medford is. Yep, right there. This is uh, in, in the top three of our counties that um, we're concerned about based on this data. Um, again, similar patterns with uh, uh, population growth and um, the uh, pro projected farmland uh, development, kind of like what we saw in Deschutes. But Jim, what, what's going on on the ground here? Well, this, this is a great comparison to compare the Oregon planning program to possibly doing some better things. If you look at the the uh, runaway sprawl, which is very similar again to the business as usual and the like, you, you'll see an awful lot of development ringing the edges of, of this metro region. I call it a metro region because there's like four cities in this area, um, Central Point, Medford, Talent, uh, well, in Jacksonville, and uh, the, the Fives, and Phoenix. So, you know, you've got all these, these cities planning for gr growth individually, um, yet they impact one of the best orchard areas in the entire state of Oregon. And when you compare left to right there, runaway sprawl with better built cities, you can see that if we had a little bit different kind of approach to urban growth and the like, we'd probably be protecting a, a lot more land uh, out there that, that uh, in some cases not only involves prime farmland, but in, involves perennial crops. Um, you know, so um, I guess uh, it, it, this is a great, it, this is a great study of how um, urban growth policy can, can could possibly be uh, looked at in a different way in Oregon um, if we went to some of the better built cities approach that, that you guys have uh, analyzed there. Okay, great. And we're going to make just one more quick stop up in Clackamas County on the border of uh, Yamhill County. Which is, it's a bit further north, right south of Portland. There's Yam Hill right there. Yeah, let's zoom in on that border right there. And Jim, if you could just briefly tell us what you see on the ground here. Sure. All right. Um, what the, what this, you know, when you look at the, the I'm going to center right on Wilsonville Sherwood because it kind of is the center of all of this. This is the South Portland metro region and the like. Um, you'll see an awful lot of um, of uh, orange there, um, which is, uh, you know, related to development. Some of that is planned development in urban growth areas. Some of it is not. But again, compare the runaway sprawl version to the better built cities. And when you just take a look at the west side of Wilsonville, for example, and, and across the Willamette River, which is French Prairie, which scares the heck out of me. Um, um, we've got some we've got some development issues there um, associated with that. Um, whereas um, looking at a different urban policy, possibly we, we might be able to, to address some of that. Um, there's just an awful lot of low density sprawl occurring in some of the areas where even if it's um, um, ultimately going to be urbanized, low density sprawl is harder to urbanize also in an efficient and effective manner. But this this map is, the work you've done here to me is is very, very scary because just to the south of the Willamette River is French Prairie. French Prairie is the heart of Oregon agriculture. All right, thank you so much. Um, and now we're gonna pass it right back over to Chris. Great, thank you, Danny, thank you, Jim, thank you, Beth, that was terrific. So now that we've 
talked and shown some of the findings, we talk, want to talk a little bit about action. What can each of us do to help choose an abundant future? If you are a county commissioner or a state legislator or a congressional staffer, our report has policy recommendations in each of these four categories tailored for your particular level of government. We hope you can find a recommendation in here that you would like to champion. We encourage you to do that. Please let us know if we can provide you with any additional information about any of the recommendations in the report. And if you are a farmer, a rancher, a community advocate, you work with a nonprofit that talks and cares about these issues, we encourage you to share and discuss these policy recommendations with your uh, elected representatives. So let's talk about just a few things within these policy recommendations. So in encouraging smart growth. So preaching smart growth to Oregon is like preaching to the choir. In our Farms Under Threat State of the State's state policy scorecard, Oregon scored first and well above any other state in its land use planning policies that support agriculture. So again, hats off to Oregon for that work that happened long ago. Going forward, though, as both the Deputy Secretary and Jim noted, it will be important not to backslide on these policies and to continue to look at how they need to be reinforced to ensure that um, they are helping to ensure compact development. Protecting agricultural land. It's exciting to see the new Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program now funding and nearing its first round of applications. Congress will be writing a new farm bill next year and an important program in that bill that can leverage this new state investment is the Agricultural Land Conservation Easement Program, which helps to fund the purchase of agricultural conservation easements from willing farmers, landowners, and ranchers. More funding for that program would help protect more farm and ranch land in Oregon. Advanced Smart Solar Siting. Local governments can ensure that best practices are followed when siting solar on farmland. This includes practices for the construction, the operation, and the decommissioning of solar development to preserve soil health, to preserve water resources, and importantly, the ability for farmers and ranchers to farm the land during and after the life of the project. And lastly, in the support farmland access, the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program includes funding to help agricultural landowners and producers with succession planning, which is an important need. So again, hats off for um, the foresight here in including this in this program. We know that older producers and landowners without heirs interested in taking over the farm or ranch would like to see their land remain in agriculture and need help in identifying a potential successor and then working with that younger producer. So this funding is critically important to help make that kind of technical assistance possible. And let me turn it back over to Danny now. So uh, by now, I hope we all know Planning for agriculture is critically important uh, to the smart growth uh, that recommendations our report recommends. This involves four basic principles, principles that can work in tandem with efforts to plan for smarter, more compact development. Uh, inventory resources, always, always engage farmers and ranchers, incorporate agriculture into community plans, and implement tools to retain and protect agricultural land. As Chris mentioned above, Oregon is leading the nation in farmland preservation through land use policy. You should all feel very proud. It is worth defending. I wanna highlight the work of 1,000 Friends of Oregon who produced the report, Death by a Thousand Cuts. It takes a deep dive into the many ways that Oregon continues to lose farmland. You should also feel proud of the work on the urban side of the equation. Statewide middle housing was a groundbreaking achievement. Today, the Land Conservation and Development Commission votes on the climate friendly and equitable, equitable communities rules, one of which would remove the minimum parking requirements from affordable housing projects. This will reduce the cost of affordable housing in urban areas and put that land to better use than parking. Keep going on this work to advance urban density and also invest in the infrastructure needed to achieve that goal. Of course, there is so much more work to do and Jim earlier highlighted some tangible solutions for Oregon's farmland that we can help move forward. 
And if you're here because you really love maps, I'll point you to some other resources. Oregon Agricultural Trust has an excellent story map that evaluates farmland con conservation opportunities in their focus areas. Central Oregon Land Watch mapped permits in Deschutes County granted for single family residences and other residential structures from 1995 to 2017. And with that, we have some time here for some uh, questions and answers. So I think we are going to all turn our videos on so that we can interact with you all. And Jim, feel free to come and join us too. Great, thank you. So let me, I am cruising through and again, I invite anybody um, to join. Um, to join in and ask a question here. Let me ask, if there are a couple of technical questions that I can answer quickly. Are the reports available for download, perhaps from the main website? Yes, you can find the reports both through the website we were just on. Again, you go up to the View Reports tab. Um, you can find them in this handout right section on your control panel. You can just download them right from there. Um, you can go to farmland.org or farmlandinfo.org and find them. So there are multiple ways of finding them. Um, another question related to, this was where can I get that media cost of community services document? Um, is if, I, if I'm correct in thinking that that was a question about what you saw on the slide that is available and many of our cost of community services studies both ours and others that have been done plus a summary of all of that can be found on the farmland information center website and again that is farmlandinfo.org um, let me ask a question of um, Jim and Danny do Oregon's urban growth boundaries include water use slash rights? Jim, I'm going to pass that straight to you. Uh, short answer, no. Um, one of the one of the issues that I've constantly had over the years is a, a relatively um, large scale disconnect between Oregon water policy and Oregon land use policy. Uh, the statewide planning goals does have a goal goal six that that talks about um, you know water planning and the like, but um, it's very ho hopefully undeveloped compared to other goals in terms of rulemaking. Um, I mean, water will come into play in some cases in terms of infrastructure as it relates to um, what the urban development needs, but it's not really taking into account the impacts that that transfer of rural water rights uh, dramatically agricultural water rights will have when it becomes urban. And so uh, my short answer, no. Okay. And uh, do you mind if I jump in with a question? You Chris? go right ahead, Danny. I see one that I am going to just, again, get a punch straight over to Jim, uh, just because you're the, uh, the, the expert uh, in Oregon. Uh, we're seeing an increase in the number and activities of land trusts in Oregon. While they have solid conservation and preservation goals around natural resources and ecosystems, they often target resource lands like exclusive farm use zoned property, which effectively removes farmland from production. How, do, how are we going to address this impact to agricultural land? Sure, I, um, it's a tough one and it's something that the ag community has had a concern with for years and that is who's going to hold an ag easement? Is it going to be for environmental purposes or for working land purposes? I guess my, my first response, and, and it, it's not an easy response, whatever, is there are several land trusts now in Oregon that focus on working lands. And so if we're really dealing with um, so, some easement issues related to that have a, a strong component of working lands. I would suggest that we need to be working with those types of land trusts as opposed to land trusts that are focused really just on wildlife or on uh, environmental issues and the like. And that's not to say that the land trusts that that deal with working lands aren't going to um, you know have concerns related to some of the other um, natural resource issues. But generally, it's not at the expense of loss of those working lands. It's a complementary approach that those land trusts take. So bottom line, work with the land trusts that have a focus on working lands first is my, my best advice. And another question here, uh, climate will impact farming and the viability of agricultural lands. 
Do we have any comments on this? Uh, one thing that we uh, didn't uh, click on in our cruise around uh, Oregon in the map is that there is a water scarcity layer uh, that can help give some kind of indication of where um, we, we may see less and less water resources, uh, but there will certainly be an impact uh, on uh, agricultural land that's not necessarily uh, captured in the map that we have because we're looking solely at uh, the threat of development. Uh, Jim, I, I was just about to pass to you. <laughs> and, and I would just add, we didn't uh, we, we didn't really look on the tour around Oregon of any of coastal communities, but if you go, uh, for those of you that are interested in this, click on Tillamook County and take a look at that really quick, and you'll see some impacts of climate change. Uh, there, a big chunk of that land that, that could be lost is due to sea level rise. And uh, so if you look at, you know, south of Tillamook Bay and that dark blue area, where those are dairies right now. And it's some of the best grass growing ground in the world. The other question I would have, though, is when you look at those estuaries, Neetarts Bay and, and Tillamook Bay, um, those both have um, high levels of aquaculture going on them, predominantly oysters. And what is sea level change going to do to them in terms of the salinity of the water? They may no longer be capable of growing oysters anymore. They may not be able to do that aquaculture. So it's not just upland uh, agriculture, but it can be have impacts on some of the actual aquaculture operations going on also. Excellent. And Chris, there's a question that just popped in that might be better um, suited for you, uh, trying to understand the graph of projected conversion of farmland on the interactive mapped page. Why is the X axis showing 160,000 total acres as opposed to the number of total acres of ag in Oregon? Um, that is, we would have to go back. I, I'm not quite sure I under, stand the question. Um, uh, again, I think the graph of projected conversion that, that 160,000 total acres is the what we expect of, um, of 160 of whatever the total number of agricultural land acres in Oregon. So um, that uh, I'm, I guess I'm not entirely sure about the question. And looking back at the graph, there's 160,000, right? So, so that is simply it's not intended to be. That is that's just looking at sort of what that uh, I guess was the next easiest roundup, but not because it's um, it's a percent right there of the total land. If I'm making any sense there. Yeah, I think I think you are, um, and that's what we that that's the time that we have for Q and A. Chris, do you want to start closing us out? Yes, I do. Thank you so much, and thank you again, Jim, for um, your helpful commentary. Thank you, Danny, ever so much. Um, thank you, Beth. Uh, I just want to talk about a couple of resources. Obviously, Danny and her colleagues in the Pacific Northwest Office of American Farmland Trust are are great. Um, experts in the region. They do lots of work in Idaho and Oregon and Washington. And if you have questions um, for American Farmland Trust, they are the very first place, a great place to start. But there are two other things that we that are complementary. And that is the one is the Farmland Information Center. Farmland Information Center is something that we do collaboratively with USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. It is a one-stop shop for any information that is either related to policy related to agricultural land use and loss. Um, it also has a lot of information for landowners, whether that's about soil health or farm succession or farmland protection and what is an agricultural conservation easement. So we encourage um, folks to go to the Farmland Information Center. And if you have a question, whether it's related to data or policy, or what a county can do, that phone number works and people do answer it. So we encourage you um, to reach out to the folks at the Farmland Information Center. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the National Agricultural Land Network is a new national network that is free, very important. Um, again, it is designed to help encourage everybody to do more. And we know that there's so much more to be done. That's what we learned here in this report and trying to build the capacity for for all of us to learn from each other is critically important and that is the 
the point of the network, and we hope that you will consider it, particularly if you're doing this work either in a professional capacity or really digging in at the local and county level. We'd love to have you. And with that, let me turn it back to Danny to close us out. So I want to thank everyone again for being here today and for your interest in preserving and protecting Oregon's agriculture. And special thanks to Lauren Henderson and Jim Johnson from ODA. We all come at this work from very diverse and sometimes divergent places and vantage points. Uh, but what really ties us together is our shared investment in this landscape. Today, we focus mostly on the threats to Oregon's agricultural land. But I, I do want to acknowledge there are many, if not more, threats to the viability of agriculture. As Chris said earlier, it's not farmland without farmers. We have many challenges and tough decisions ahead of us, but I'm optimistic that our common ground is a powerful asset that can serve us well as we plan for the future. I hope that you will continue to look to American Farmland Trust as a resource and partner in your work. Thank you so much. Great, thank you all.